Top 10 is the podcast from the BBC World Service ranking the best African players. This guy is recognised as the best in the world. Teams. Ball coming, turn, boom. And the biggest moments in African football. The whole world remembers that. Remember that, yeah. It's not just African fans. Match of the day, Africa Top 10. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome to the documentary from the BBC World Service with me, Krasi Twig. I present the Global Jigsaw podcast from BBC Monitoring, where we look at the world through the lens of its media to understand the competing narratives. In this episode, we examine the Wagner mutiny from the perspective of countries which have a reason to pay close attention. Russian MP Andrei Gurulov on state TV a day after the revolt, spelling out what he says is the only way forward, a bullet in Prigozhin's head. Francis Scar from our Russia team spent hours glued to the TV screen, waiting for official reaction and updates on this fast-moving story. There was almost nothing for quite a while. The silence was for many hours pretty deafening. We saw in the afternoon on Friday Yevgeny Prigozhin posting an audio message and it was only actually at half past one in the morning, Moscow time, that the main presenter of the news on Channel One, one of the main state channels, was whisked back into the studio, presumably out of bed, to give this emergency news bulletin. Кстати, на первом канале специальный выпуск новостей в студии Екатерина Андреева. В пятницу вечером в социальных сетях от имени Евгения Пригожина стал активным... Nothing much happened overnight, and it was only in the morning when President Putin gave this address, in which he accused the organizers of this uh, armed mutiny, as he named it, as traitors, without naming, of course, Yevgeny Prigozhin himself. And I think really this shows how much this rattled President Putin. And after that, we saw from Russian state TV what we normally see when Russia is faced by some kind of crisis. They stick very closely to statements coming from the top until later on when they get their firmer instructions. So once they receive those instructions, what kind of takes did you hear from the all influential TV personalities? Well, this is uh, known as the Metodichka among Russian media watchers. It's an instruction that comes down from the Kremlin to state TV channels on how to cover certain developments. And what we saw once it became clear that this mutiny had failed was an attempt to present it as some kind of victory that Russian society had shown absolutely no support for this failed mutiny attempt. Ignoring, of course, the videos we saw coming on social media out of Rostov where Yevgeny Prigozhin is being cheered. The very fact that these Wagner fighters were allowed to get within 200 kilometers of Moscow, if, if Prigozhin is to be believed, showed that this unity that we saw trumpeted on state TV was perhaps not quite as clear cut as they might want the Russian people to believe. We've seen people locked for innocuous acts like attending protests, and yet here you have a mutiny, and there are victims of this mutiny, and they get away with it? Well, that's one of the biggest questions that is hanging over this whole issue, is that in Russia you can be jailed for years for a post on social media if the authorities deem it to be violating one of the many laws effectively strangling free speech. And yet Putin himself has admitted that several pilots were killed by Wagner fighters on their march towards Moscow and yet charges have been dropped against them by the Russian authorities. This is very confusing given that state media has been really hammering home the point that Prigozhin is a traitor. Dmitry Kisilov, he's one of the key presenters on Russian TV in his main weekly show, airing an old interview with President Putin in which he's asked, are you able to forgive people? And President Putin answers, yeah. I can forgive most things, but not betrayal. Now, this doesn't sit easily with the fact that suddenly these people have been allowed to go to Belarus without any kind of punishment. There is a lot of speculation and unconfirmed reports about what is happening in Russia. After the show of unity on the main Russian TV channels, 
the conspicuous silence on the subject of the mutiny returned. And what I think is interesting is that by Tuesday, so just three days after these events, it had almost disappeared entirely from state TV. It was almost as if this coup or mutiny, whatever you want to call it, was such a minor development that it didn't need to be covered anymore. And this shows that they want the Russian population to pretty much forget about this and, and move on. Yevgeny Prigozhin is the man of the hour, but up until a year ago, little was known about him. This is a man, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who has been called Putin's chef in the past for his catering contracts being provided to the Kremlin and has been regarded by many as someone who Putin could rely on to do the Kremlin's dirty business in many areas. The thing with Prigozhin is up until around last year when we saw him recruiting prisoners to go and fight for Wagner in Ukraine. <laughs> This was an extremely shadowy figure. We knew very little about him. And there were rare photos of him. There's a photo of him serving wine to George W. Bush in the Kremlin when he visited decades ago. And there's a photo of him at a meeting between President Putin and various members of the Russian military elite with representatives of Libya, a country where Wagner mercenaries were believed to be active and it's only really a year ago that he gained more of a public profile became very active on social media posting these audio messages convicted in his youth for theft and robbery prigozhin spent nine years in jail so he clicked with the prison crowd and once they joined his mercenary group he could count on their loyalty wagner fighters first appeared in ukraine in 2014 not long after that, they were spotted in several locations in the Middle East too, which explains those pictures of Prigozhin with Libyan officials. Four years ago, Wagner backed renegade general Khalifa Haftar's attempt to take the Libyan capital Tripoli. Samia Hosni from our Middle East team followed their trail. Eastern Libya is dominated by a strong man, Khalifa Haftar, and he's had massive support and crucial support from Wagner since 2019. Are they still deployed and do we know how large their contingent is? We have uh, reports and Western assessments that say that uh, Wagner forces are based in oil installations and military bases in eastern and southeast Libya all dominated and controlled by the Libyan National Armies of Khalifa Haftar. Libya has been divided since 2014 into competing political and military factions based in different parts of the country. So how has the media there covered the news of the Wagner rebellion? Pro Haftar outlets were noticeably silent. Naturally, the anti Haftar media were interested in the development. If you look at the Libya al Haraj channel based in, uh, in Turkey, they did cover the mutiny and in their flagship talk show, they had two guests who are anti-Putin, anti-Wagner, anti-Haftar. And they talked at length about the possible scenarios, what would happen next. We hear about people wishing unseating Putin because that could result in Wagner pulling out of eastern Libya. Is that what stands in the way of Libya being a united country? That is one of the reasons why Libya is, is so divided. Foreign interference, whether by Wagner, by Turkey, by neighboring Egypt, Foreign interference is a key obstacle to Libya being reunited again. There is another divided country in the Middle East where Wagner has played a critical role. In Syria, first of all, Putin's air power and military and political backing to Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president, was crucial. It kept him in power. It helped him in shifting the tide of the conflict since 2015. The conflict Samia mentioned started as a peaceful uprising against the president 12 years ago and turned into a full-scale civil war. It has left at least half a million people dead and hundreds of thousands missing. 
The different sides of the conflict naturally have opposing views on Russia's and Wagner's role there. How was Prigozhin's mutiny seen in Syria? We saw the news agency SANA, which is the state news agency, running posts talking about Western disappointment, talking about Wagner's downfall, and saying that it's business as usual in, in Russia. Opposition media in Syria are reveling in the news of Wagner turning against Putin. Some outlets were discussing and debating and hoping that what's happening could be the beginning of the end for Putin. Abdirahim Saeed from our jihadist media team brings another perspective on this story. Russia and the Wagner group have a military footprint in various Muslim conflict zones and militant jihadist groups present in these conflict zones are fighting on the opposite side. The two high-profile jihadist groups, Islamic State Group and Al-Qaeda, have previously made their enmity clear to Russia and Wagner. So it's no surprise supporters of these groups have been quick to show their glee on social media platforms. So what have they been saying on, on those platforms that you watch? Mainly they've been painting the recent events in Russia as divine justice. That's what they've been calling it. They see the mutiny as an unexpected chance, a potential weak spot in a powerful adversary. One official from the dominant Islamist group HTS in Syria, which is fighting the Syrian government and which used to be an Al-Qaeda affiliate, welcomed the Russian infighting. Another figure used to be linked to this same group in Syria, HDS, prayed for a fierce war between the Russians that will keep, in his words, them busy. How are the Wagner mercenaries seen in Syria and why has Russia sent them there in the first place? Samia again. So they are seen as part of the Russian military presence in Syria. And Russia has a big military base, a Hmeme military base near Latakia. And it's crucial for Russia's emerging power as a global power, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. Putin is not just an ally of Assad. They provide the lifeline for his survival. Putin is the one who calls the shot in Syria, basically. In the past, we saw a lot of Putin flying directly to Hamamim and not stopping in Damascus. Three years after their involvement in Syria began, Wagner mercenaries appeared in an unexpected location, in a country that has never been part of the Soviet sphere of influence. It was 2018, and the initial mission was to provide security to the president of the Central African Republic. The Russians were seen to have successfully quelled a rebellion there, which entrenched public support for them in the wider region at a time of strong anti-colonial sentiments. Our African media analyst Beverly Ochieng explains the consequences. French forces have left Mali and the Wagner mercenaries are believed to have taken over some of their bases in the northern regions. There has been an aggressive anti-French, anti-UN forces campaign both in the Central African Republic and in Mali. Mali has called for the expulsion of UN peacekeepers. Here is Mali's foreign minister Abdoulaye Diop requesting at the UN that around 13,000 MINUSMA personnel leave without delay. The government of Mali demands the retrait sans delay of the MINUSMA. Cependant, the government is disposed to cooperate with the Nations Unies. And place. activists in Mali who are pro Russian, they want UN peacekeepers to be replaced by Russian forces. À partir de minuit, zero, zero. Last week, the UN Security Council voted to end its peacekeeping mission in the country. The withdrawal of MINUSMA forces started on 1st of July, according to Mali State TV. Au mandat de la MINUSMA, mais aussi qui demande que, à compter du 1er juillet déjà, le processus de cessation. Wagner's purported aim in Mali is to fight jihadist groups, and they clearly enjoy some popular support. But there is a feeling in some quarters that Russia's mercenaries have worsened the security situation. The U.S. Treasury accused them of engaging in mass executions, rape and abductions, both in Mali and the CAR. The Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project put the number of civilian deaths in Mali at 2,000, just in 2022. Before the mutiny, Wagner's leader spelled out the group's ambitions for the continent. 
Prigozhin made some public statements about the possibility that some of his strongest fighters would be going to Africa. There was also this wave of recruitment advertisements on pro-Wagner outlets that were targeting French-speaking countries. Our team has observed how the Kremlin's message has been amplified by Africa-based troll farms, allegedly run by Prigozhin. In addition to the advertised aim of providing security, a big reason for Wagner's presence on the continent is believed to be money-making. The CAR, for example, is rich in natural resources like diamond, copper, gold, uranium, and Russia's mercenary arm has reportedly been involved in the mining business. In the CAR, the economic interests of the Wagner Group continue to grow. They're now in the vodka business. There was an allegation that they attacked a French beer factory that was based in Bongi, and they're still aggressively attacking Western interests in the CAR. And the dependency that the CAR has on the Wagner Group is concerning in light of the rebellion. Transparency has not been Wagner's forte with regards to its financing. Its dealings have always been a murky affair. But last week, there was a big revelation, which Francis picked up. Most people had assumed that it was funded by the Russian state through some kind of shadowy schemes, which allowed them this plausible deniability, this ability to distance themselves from Wagner and its activities in the Middle East and in Africa. Only last year, President Putin denied that Russia had anything to do with the Wagner Group. Wagner, of course, became much more prominent in the public eye since the invasion of Ukraine. And on the 27th of June, Putin actually admitted that Wagner had been funded by the state saying that between May 2022 and May 2023 alone, the state had paid Wagner 86 billion rubles, so just over a billion dollars for salaries and incentive payments. And this was just dropped in by Putin in the wake of the failed mutiny. And really, this is a a huge admission, something that people had been trying to get to the bottom of for years now, and the Russian state had just denied. This is Vladimir Putin, publicly owning Wagner as Russia's foreign policy tool for the first time, removing the group's key design feature, plausible deniability. So what's the likely impact of the mutiny on Wagner operations in Africa if the group goes under the control of the Russian armed forces? Back to Bev. In the short term, it's not clear if there will be an immediate change to operations. There was a statement by Lavrov in the aftermath of the mutiny saying that Russian instructor operations in the CAR and in Mali will continue. He didn't call them the Wagner Group. In theory, the Wagner Group is indispensable to the Kremlin because it has enabled it to gain a foothold in regions that had either been forgotten by the West or regions where they've been able to dislodge the West and demonstrate their diplomatic strength and also their sort of credibility when it comes to defense and military opportunities and security cooperation. But it's also a bit of a concern when Prigozhin post-mutiny said that only 1-2% to of Wagner fighters had registered at the Ministry of Defense. Is there the possibility of a standoff between locally based Wagner mercenaries as well as Russian forces or Russian diplomatic engagements in those countries? It's still something to be seen and whether African governments will be forced to have to choose between the two. This is the documentary from the BBC World Service. Wagner's ambitions seem to have crossed into yet another continent where Russia has old friends. Not surprisingly, a lot of it is in the realm of sightings and unconfirmed reports. Here's more insight from Pascal Fletcher from our Latin America team. There was a very specific report of a group of Wagner paramilitaries arriving in Venezuela in January 2019. And these reports came from international news agencies and security consultancies. And they basically said there was a group of sort of several hundred of them with the specific mission of protecting Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and protecting him against possible kidnapping or assassination or overthrow, possibly being backed by the U.S., 
This was a period where there were reports of sort of unrest and, and, and even sort of revolts within the, the Venezuelan armed forces. So we have that very specific report. But besides that, there have been really quite frequent reports and sightings of suspected Russian military in parts of Venezuela, in the southeast state of Bolivar, and also along the Colombian frontier, where there have been a lot of sort of clashes with armed groups. And because of the nature of the kit and the weaponry that they carry, the suspicion is that they are Russians. But they could also be straight, you know, Russian uh, regular force military, because it's no secret that Venezuela has a, a military cooperation agreement with Russia. Is there anything being reported beyond the group providing security services? It's difficult to say, but certainly there has been a coincidence between reports of the presence of, you know, suspected Russian military personnel, including potential Wagner, in gold mining areas of Venezuela. That would be southeast Bolivar province, which is really the sort of the heart of their gold producing area. But also, too, you know, protecting oil installations, some of which, of course, you know, are shared or have been used in the past by Russian companies like Rosneft. So who are Russia's friends in this region and how have they responded to the news of the Wagner revolt? Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua made very clear that they consider themselves strategic allies of Russia. We actually saw the Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro, Cuban president Miguel Diaz-Canel and Nicaraguan president Daniel Ortega specifically sending on Twitter, on social media, greetings and solidarity and support to the Russian president. Here's a message from Nicolas Maduro. ¿Y qué pretende el mundo? Que el presidente Putin... And what does the world expect? that President Putin should just sit around and not act in defense of his people? That is why Venezuela announces all of its support to President Vladimir Putin in the defense of Russia's peace. More widely, I think countries in Latin America reported the incidences of this and as in the Western media, you know, also raised a lot of questions. Does this show weakness inside of Russia? But in those three countries, in the Allies, very much solidarity, support and towing the Kremlin line. You couldn't expect a more different reaction from Ukraine. We have Margarita Melyukova to bring the perspective from a country invaded by Russia. When the mutiny broke out, there was an explosion of memes on social media. It looked like people just lost sleep over the story because there was so much excitement. And uh, the memes touched on a number of topics. For example, there were jokes that Prigozhin was recruited by Ukrainian intelligence and that this whole story was part of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Everyone was wondering where the counteroffensive would begin. Would it be in the south of Ukraine? Would it be in the east of Ukraine? But it turned out that it started in Russia. So the joke goes. There were memes in which Prigozhin was described as this Ukrainian Kozak was a typical Kozak fringe. They changed his name to Yevhen Prigozhko to make it sound more Ukrainian. Ukrainians have been using humor throughout the war as a way of coping. There are no illusions about Wagner in Ukraine. It's infamous. It's reportedly involved in some of the worst atrocities, including the Bucha massacre. But this humor is meant to lift people's spirits, to make them believe that Ukraine is capable of anything. On TV, for example, Prigozhin was still described as a terrorist when uh, there were reports about uh, this mutiny. And uh, the dominant sentiment was that this fight should continue between Prigozhin and Putin, that the longer it continues, the better it is for Ukraine. There was some hopeful analysis saying that this was the beginning of Russia's disintegration. But there are certainly other concerns. Some are saying that when Putin is humiliated, he might be tempted to escalate the situation. Even when the mutiny was underway, Ukraine was subject to a Russian missile attack. There were more than 40 missiles fired on Ukraine. There are reports of uh, Wagner units being redeployed to Belarus, and Prigozhin reportedly also moved to Belarus. And this has raised concerns about possibly another attack on Ukraine from the north. However, the Ukrainian army is saying that such an attack would be suicidal because Ukraine has built many lines of defenses. People are not overly optimistic and are trying to be realistic and uh, have faith most of all in the Ukrainian army because that's the thing that Ukrainians can really count on. 
Let's head back to Russia now where it all started. Yevgeny Prigozhin is best known for heading the Wagner Group, but he has many hats, not to mention the chef's hat. He is the founder of a domestic media empire known as the Patriot Media Group. Its closure has just been announced. Here's a reminder from Francis of its activities and reach. His most well-known website is called Ria Fan and has done many so-called investigations. I think you could perhaps call them hatchet jobs on the Russian opposition, for example. He's also involved in making films. One of his companies produced a film about Wagner's activities in Libya. There's also been a film about the Central African Republic. In which they've been depicted as heroes who have come to maintain security in states left in chaos by the former colonial powers, such as the French. And before Wagner became a household name, Prigozhin was best known in the West for the so-called Troll Farm or the Internet Research Agency, as it's officially known, a body based in Saint Petersburg, which was accused by the U.S. government of interfering in the 2016 election for president and helping Donald Trump to beat Hillary Clinton in that electoral race. The Telegram channels associated with the Wagner Group have also just made an announcement, a freeze on recruitment for a month. As with so many aspects of this global story, the key to it is in Russia. And we in BBC Monitoring continue to read the media landscape to find the missing bits of the jigsaw. You've been listening to the documentary from the BBC World Service, brought to you this week by the Global Jigsaw podcast team, Krista Shatteri and me, Krasi Twig.